but it's that it develops this little comfort like a whoopee almost where we become convinced we have to have it to have peace Mm -hmm. Right. And so what God would want to do in that place is remind you that your life is not fragile. Right. Mm -hmm. That you having peace is not at the mercy of your routine. That it's okay if you like that and it'll get back to normal. But you can also have peace even should your routine be thrown out of whack for a while. And so what will happen in that place when you're feeling stressed in that place, it's typically because you don't know what to do without your routine. You, you got so set in your routine. You like your routine. Mm-hmm. It's nice, especially for you. You spent 60 plus years figuring out what you like and you don't like. Right. And you got it worked into this nice little place where you, you feel comfort and relaxed. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. Yeah. But you also want to be reminded that in the midst of the routine being subverted for a little while, your life isn't so fragile that the routine has to be there. And so what you want to happen in that place is you begin thinking on the life of God and how God's life isn't fragile and how God's life can overcome even if the routine gets thrown off instead of thinking of what's going to happen with this. And there's nothing wrong with that thought and having that thought come to you. But you want to be careful that you don't find yourself sitting and meditating on that thought. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that thought doesn't possess the ability to give you peace. And so if you chew on it, if you chew on it and take it into your stomach and spit it back out and chew on it some more, chew on it some more, you're going to start feeling more and more anxious about what about my routine? What am I going to do? Right? And so it's just in that place that that Paul or Peter would say something like, I want to stir you up by way of remembrance. Mm -hmm. It's not that you don't know this truth. It's just that right now, you're kind of meditating on, man, this sucks. My routine's gone. What am I going to do? How am I going to? This is, and it's okay to feel that thought, but then you, you want to be careful to run with it and not start twisting on that. You want to sit down and get quiet with God and talk to God about how, His life and think about how God is living inside of you and how God was able to sleep on a boat even while there was a raging hurricane. Right. So what is it about you, God, that you can do that? I don't understand because I'm in a, which seems like a lesser of a storm, but a storm nonetheless. My routine's being uprooted and I don't know how I can sleep. Right? Mm-hmm. And so you just start talking with God. I know you can, Lord. And I know you're in me. And I'm struggling to see it right now. And I find my mind is just filled with, what am I going to do? And you just start talking with God along those lines. And before you know it, He's going to quicken inside of you this thing, this strength. Because it says, in our weakness, God is made strong. Paul, you're feeling weakness right now because the routine is uprooted. Paul felt weakness. He talked about the thorn in the flesh. And he, what am I going to do? Look at these people. They're destroying all the good work we've been doing. They're uprooting the church. He, he thought his weakness was a sign he was being overcome. And then all of a sudden, Jesus came and said, My grace is your sufficiency, not your routine. Your sufficiency is not your routine, although you can like it. Your sufficiency is His grace. And then He goes on to say, For my grace, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Mm -hmm. So when we're feeling that weakness, we want our minds to go to the fact that God's strength is our sufficiency and His strength is made strong in our weakness. I mean, even God's weakness is better than our strength. Even God's weakness is better than our routine. God's weakness contains more power than our routine. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, Paul had his eyes set on what he wanted to have peace being blown up. And he thought, what am I going to do? And then Jesus come and said, bro, your sufficiency wasn't in this going right. Your sufficiency is in my grace. And my grace isn't at the mercy of your weakness. My grace actually wells up when you're in weakness. And then Paul started getting this thing where he just felt filled with joy. He said, rather than let me glory in my weakness. See, all of a sudden he got a revelation that even this weakness I'm feeling, it can't keep me from life. He said, so now even when I feel weakness, I find something in me that says, glory to God, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. What he's saying there is, my eyes were set on my weakness, and so then I felt like, what am I going to do? I'm being conquered. How am I going to get by? He said, then all of a sudden, Christ spoke to me, and my eyes got set on his strength as my sufficiency. And I see that his strength overcomes in all things. I have a record of it. I saw the resurrected Christ and he talked to me. Mm -hmm. 
And so I have a record of this. He said, so then my eyes got set back on the strength of God and how that strength is made perfect even when my flesh feels weak, even when this world makes me feel weak. So rather, even when I feel weak, I can rejoice in God. And so all he's saying there is his heart got connected back onto the life of God. So when our routine gets subverted, when what we like gets subverted, when what we know to be good gets subverted, that's okay. And it's okay to feel it. And it's okay to think, damn, I wish it wouldn't have gone that way. And I'll be real glad when it's over. You bet. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I'm available for this to end ASAP. <laughs> ASAP. Right? But then after you go through that, you let it go and you begin thinking with God about his arm. And the strength of his arm. And how even his arm can overcome this subversion. That even his arm possesses the ability to give you peace. Even in the midst of that. And if you don't believe that it can, that's the conversation you want to have with God. If you feel doubtful that it can, because you don't see how that works, that's the conversation you want to have with God. Right? Yes. You see how this works? This happens to every human. Because we're in a world where there's tribulation. Right. That's why Jesus said, listen... In the world, you will find tribulation, but never fear, for I have overcome the world. And so if you don't know what that looks like in this situation, then let your conversation with God be, listen, I've heard the words, overcome the world. I've heard Greg talk about some of the things, and I get that, but I'm struggling to experience overcoming right now, God. And just be honest, I'm struggling to experience it, right? And just start talking with him. I'm telling you, something beautiful will happen inside of you. Something dynamic where the cares that you were carrying will be lifted off of you. And next thing you know, you'll find your heart filled with thanksgiving. Where you're thanking God that he's causing you to overcome. That nothing can overcome you. And you begin seeing yourself as winning instead of losing. Right? It don't feel good to lose, does it? What if your mind is always filled with, I'm losing. I'm coming behind. I'm being overcome, then you're going to feel not so nice. And so God will come and bring forth something in you where you say, I'm winning. Nothing can keep me from winning. Nothing can stop me from winning. Thank you, Father. You see, and now your heart turns to thanksgiving and all of a sudden the cares get shrunk. Real small. Right? So be of good cheer. It's okay that you feel this way. Even the great apostle Paul felt this way. He said, pressed but not stressed beyond measure. Persecuted, but not destroyed. Mm -hmm. Right? He talked about things coming against him, but him not being in despair. Always bearing about in himself the sufferings of our Lord Jesus. Right? Right. What does that mean? Not that he was suffering, but he was always bearing about in himself in those moments that the world came against him, that he was dead to death. He was dead to the life that was in the world. That his strength was not found in the life he could suck out of the world. That his strength was not found in his life in the world being situated perfectly. That he was dead to that life. He was always bearing about in himself the suffering Jesus experienced when Jesus died on the cross to the life that was in the world. When he gave up the ghost. When he laid down the life that was in the world. When Jesus found something in his heart that he said, even should I make this life that's in the world perfect, it's still death. It still can't give me peace. It still can't give me joy. And then he gave it up. Right? So Paul said, even pressed but not in despair. Persecuted but not destroyed. Paul experienced great suffering. He said, always bearing about in myself in those moments. The death I died with Christ. I'm dead to the life that's in the world. That world isn't my life. Nor can it give me life. And even should I get it to look real glossy and pretty for a while, it can't give me life. Paul's life was pretty glossy and pretty, according to the world standard, before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had all the degrees. He came from a prominent family. He was brought up in the most prestigious Jewish rabbi system. His parents were rich. He spoke multiple languages. He was well on his way to being the high priest. He had it all going for him. Right? And so he... He realized, what did he say? I count it all as dung. And see, so what happens is our routines that we like that are okay, we, we get used to liking them, and before we know it, our hearts are counting them as excellency yeah. instead of dung. And then what happens is, is we get real comfortable in that excellency because we like it that way. Listen, I like this for breakfast. 
And I prefer to have that not, instead of not having that, right? But we can have that without counting that as excellency. We want to count that as dung. We don't want our hearts to become confused and think that's the thing that gives us peace. Or that that's what we have to have to have peace. Because then every time we don't have it, we're going to be lost. And if we find ourselves in that place, glory to God, He's still right there with us. And He's still in us. And He's ministering to whatever part we can grab onto in that moment. He hasn't forsaken us. He, he's not like, well, don't they see? We've given up the ghost. <laughs> do, do you see? So he'll, he'll, he'll speak to whatever part in your heart you can grab onto. And so I don't say this to make you feel ashamed if you don't find that going on. I say this just because it's the truth. And I happen to know that declaring the truth has a supernatural ability in the hearts of humans. You know, the declaration of the truth is the preaching of God's heart. It's the preaching of the faith that's in his heart. That has a dynamic effect in our hearts. The word faith actually contains within it the power to produce the thing that it says. It's like a seed. You put a seed into the ground and that seed contains the power to bring forth the plant. The heart of God, when you preach it, it contains within it the power to persuade our hearts and to bring something forth in us where we start believing the same thing God believes. It's called being persuaded. Faith is preached, the faith of God, so that our hearts can be persuaded by what He's persuaded of. And then we find our life born from His faith. Right? Right? And so that's how that thing looks, and that's how it would work. And so be of good cheer. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with loving your routine, but don't count on it as your excellency. Your excellency is the power of the resurrection and the fact that you were crucified with him to being at the mercy of the life in this world, right? And so when the, when the, when the things you like in this world get kicked over, knocked down, they will. I think we've all lived long enough to know they will. <laughs> So we've all lived long enough to know that life in this world can't give us life. Nobody got the life in this world to look pretty enough to where it brought them out of the grave. <laughs> right? Well, no matter how pretty the life you can make in this world, it's still going to die. <laughs> and it can't bring you out of the grave. And so Paul saw that, man, and he knew what it meant that he was crucified with Christ. And so he count- his life was pretty. It wasn't that it was ugly and he gave up an ugly life. He actually had what Jesus said, how hard is it for a rich guy to enter into the kingdom? Paul was a rich guy. How long will you kick against a prick, man? Paul had it all. It looked nice and shiny. He labored more abundantly than them all, even in the Jewish system. He said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said he was blameless under the law more than anyone. So he was first place in everything. He had all the plaques. He had the shiny statues. He had all the praises of man, all the praises of the world. He was of the prestigious tribe of Benjamin. And he counted the beauty of the world, not the ugly. He counted the beauty of the world as ugly, as dung, because he realized it can't give me the life I've been coveting. That's why he said his sin was covetousness. He wasn't coveting women. He was coveting life. Through the world. And through the good in the world he could get. And then he saw, that can't give me life. He counted it as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. That he might know the power of the resurrection. What power? That you have a life that overcomes the world. You have a life that can overcome if your routine gets messed up. You have a life that can overcome should something in the world be screwy or crooked for a while. You have a life that can restore your joy, restore your peace, restore your mind. You have a life that isn't at the mercy of the world. Right? That's the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. That's the power of the resurrection. Being made conformable to his sufferings. Again, he's not talking about I go and suffer like he does. He's talking about Jesus suffered on the cross when he laid down the life in the world. He felt the weight of it and he laid down the life. He said, now I find my heart being made equal to what was in the heart of Jesus when Jesus counted the life in the world as dung. Right? If your heart judges the life in the world to be dung, then you get set free from what happens when it don't go right because you're not busy thinking it gives you something to begin with 
It's a dangerous place. I want to say dangerous like we need to be afraid, but it can be a slippery slope if things go well for us in the world for a while because before we know it, it's like we think that's what we need. We get in our comfort range, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. We're just being reminded. It's not like, what kind of a Christian am I that I forgot? I should know this. How long have I been sitting with Greg? No, no, no. No, no, no. It's that we all need to be reminded sometimes because it's so easy to, man, I like this. Now it's gone. What the heck? Lord? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Does, does that make sense? Yes. And, and, and listen, this is actually the power of, of the gospel is that the life in this world is all the time trying to compel us to clean it up and make it look real pretty based on our knowledge of good and evil. And it, it convinces us that if we can do that, that we have a knowledge of what's good and what's evil. And if we can situate our life enough according to our knowledge of what's good and evil, that's the key. And see, it gets us setting our eyes on that life as if it is where life is found. But it's not. And that's why the idea that we're never going to that we're going to get to the place where we don't have fellowship with the cross anymore is is heretical. The idea that we're going to get to the place where we don't need to talk about the resurrection weekly with each other, be reminded of it weekly. It's heretical. It's a message of the devil trying to get us to become forgetful that death has been conquered and our life has been removed from the dust and the earth and it's been braided together with the eternal one and our treasure is in heaven, not in earth. Mm -hmm. That's what it wants to do. And so we ought not feel ashamed that we come together and talk about the same thing every week. We ought to rejoice. Yes. And we'll come at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. Right? We might, like I probably never talked about it from this angle specifically. And so all we do is we take the wisdom that is Christ. Paul said, this one thing I purpose to know in your midst, Christ and him crucified. And so what we do is we take that truth that was revealed in Christ and him crucified and we discern all of our lives from every angle that the world comes at us whenever it comes at us with it. And we'll find great peace and joy restored in those moments. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. You guys see that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That has to be instantaneous. No. Yes, because we all want to say, and then we want to come back to okay. It's normal to be moved by the corruption in the world. It's no, I said it's normal. God was moved. God. Right? So the only thing about God was is he wasn't ashamed that his flesh felt weak when it was dying. Because he realized that death isn't of God. <laughs> right? So he didn't despise himself for despising the death. <laughs> Right? He, he didn't count that there was something wrong with him when he felt the weakness of his flesh dying. He didn't say, what's wrong with me that I don't like this? <laughs> what's wrong with me that when the corruption comes knocking at my door, that I'm not just immediately, la, 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 la. What's wrong with me that I got to go sit and talk with Abba? See, Jesus didn't think that. It made sense to him that he could feel this way. And so his heart cried out to Abba. He didn't feel ashamed that he felt that way. Right? He knew it was normal to feel that way when we're confronted with the life from the world. Now, he, I used to think that nothing could happen to me unless God wanted it to happen to me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I knew He always wanted good for me. Even in grace, I knew that. And then when something bad would happen to me, I'd start to self-analyze and think, what's going on? How could this possibly happen? Right. You know? Uh-huh. Mm. That, that'll make you that'll confuse you yes. that's actually the confusion that comes from the death and darkness in the earth because even if we don't realize it we all sit with the underlying wiring in our heart that tells us we were made for life we were made for good and God wants good for us we all actually have that underlying persuasion wired into our hearts because our hearts have been created by God and so when we encounter death or something that isn't good confusion comes And then the confusion starts to become the place that we reason from about God, right? Right. That confusion wants to convince us God has abandoned us. How could God let this happen? What's going on? Am I far from God now? Is it that I'm separated from life? Is it that God doesn't want good for me? Do you see all the confusion that can come? All that's with the intent to try to compel you to give yourself life. Mm -hmm. 
right? To trust in your own works. Mm -hmm. Like Adam, the confusion came. What did God say? Who told you you were naked, bro? <laughs> That's right, who told you? Did I come and uncover your nakedness? <coughs> did I come and tell you that I've abandoned you? Mm -mm. Did I come and tell you that you're no longer mine? Did I come and tell you that, yeah, you're a wretch, bro? <laughs> <laughs> did I come and say, I would that you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, so I spit you out. <laughs> That's not what God said. God didn't come to Adam and say, man, look at your body of death. <laughs> I spit you out. God didn't say that, man. God said, gosh, Adam, I know you can't see, but I want to be with you even in this place. So let me clothe you so your shame is covered up and we can talk again. Yeah. Right? Right. That's right? I have a question in a different direction, if it's all right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I was having a conversation with one of my grandkids and we started talking about the Great Commission and I tried to explain why the Great Commission isn't the Great Commission and I botched it really badly. So can you explain why the Great Commission isn't the yeah, Great Commission? Yeah, there's a whole message on that called, uh, there's a bunch of messages okay. on it, but there's one, it's a Bible study called The Spirit of the Evangelist. Okay. We talked about the Great Commission in there. But the words Great Commission actually aren't in the Bible at all. Right. First of all, they're not in the Bible. And what it is, is it's human beings not understanding what Paul understood when he said he waits patiently to wait for the redemption of his body and for God to glorify the earth and bring forth his physical kingdom in the earth. And it stems from humans thinking it's their responsibility to bring forth the kingdom in the right. earth. Okay? And so then we turn that into this is what we have to do. Okay? Now, when Jesus told the disciples to go ye into all the world, they already wanted to go. They were already followers of Christ. They already laid down their life in the world and followed Jesus of their own desire. Mm -hmm. Not because Jesus commanded them to follow him. Why do you think he only had 12? He didn't command any of them to follow him. He found the ones who would and they already laid down their lives to walk with him. Of their own free will, right. they did it. Right? Right? He didn't command them to do it. So, when it comes to go ye, he's talking to those 12. People who have all, you have to understand what position are those 12 if you want to understand how it would be applicable to us. Mm -hmm. They had already given up everything of their own free will. They already had a burning in their bones to declare the Christ. Right? This wasn't commanding them to have a burning in their bones. They already sat with the burning in their bones. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so then Jesus is, he's also talking to Jewish people, which is very important. And you have to understand the context of what the Jew thought. What did Peter say when God said, rise up and kill and eat that, Peter? Peter said, not so, Lord, I will never eat. It. I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And what was he saying that in context to? The Gentiles. Right. So there was a big chasm between Jew and Gentile. Right? Which was, God is for Jews and not for Gentiles. Salvation is for Jews and not for Gentiles. Right? The Messiah is for Jews and not for Gentiles. That's why Peter was eating with the Gentiles, but then when the Judaizers come, he even got up and left the Judaizers. Even well after Christ. Because he was ashamed of what the Judaizers were going to say to him. How are you eating with Gentiles? Right. Okay? So Jesus is talking to a group of people who think the Messiah is for Jews and not Gentiles who think that salvation is for Jews and not Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So the gospel must be for Jews and not Gentiles. So Jesus says to them, go ye into all of the world, not just Jewish people, not just Jerusalem, not just the areas inside of Israel. This message isn't only for Jewish people. This message is for the whole world. If you notice before that, Jesus told them to only go into the house of Israel. Right. Before he died, when they went out on their first quote-unquote mission trip, only go to the house of Israel. Right? Yeah. So he's contradicting that now, not because he's saying something different, but because the context is different now. Because a new man has been raised up who's neither Jew nor Gentile. And so that means that this new man is the word that's being preached to the world. And since this new man isn't Jew or Gentile, the word that's preached to the world is for all people, not just Jews. 
And so Jesus is saying, go ye into all the world, not just Jerusalem, not just the people who are Jews. This message is for everyone. Though we knew Christ Jesus after the flesh prior to his death and resurrection, we no longer know him after the flesh. We no longer look and say he's a Jewish guy. Right. <laughs> right? And so that means the message is for the whole world. And that's what Paul talked about. Mm -hmm. Paul described why he preached the gospel to Jews and Gentiles. He described it, and let me tell you something, nowhere in there does it say anything about a great commission. What he says in there is that his heart has been captivated by the love of Christ for all people. That if one man died, that means all were dead, and this one man died for and as all. So the message I preach is to all the world because I see that the Christ passion wasn't just for Jewish people. It was for everyone. And because I see that his heart was filled with love for the whole world and I see how he laid down his life for the whole world, man, that has touched me in a profound way. And my heart's been captivated by the love of Christ for all people. So now I tell all people about this message. Right. That's the spirit of evangelism. Right. You become captivated by the love of God for all people. Then there's a burning in your bones, a fire in your bones. You can't shut up. You guys ever wonder, why can't that guy shut up? <laughs> why can't that guy let somebody else talk? Listen, I, tr listen, I go home and pray and ask God, Lord, can, can I be quiet today so other people can talk? Can there's a burning in my bones. It becomes difficult for me because my heart's been captivated by the love of God for all people. Woe was me if anything I did was born from some great commission. You must. Woe was me if it was born from some commandment. That's not living by the Spirit. No. That's not being led by the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't lead by commandment. The Spirit doesn't lead by thou shalt and thou shalt not. That's not how the Spirit leads, man. That's not why Jesus preached. Jesus is the Word made flesh about evangelism. Now, did God have to command Jesus to go? Or did Jesus have a burning in His bones to go? Yes. Didn't God the Father and God the Son cut a covenant with each other when Abraham was put to sleep? Do you see the Father commanding the Son to walk through the animals? Or was the Son of the same mind as the Father? Did they share the same passion? Did they share the same heart for the world? That's where evangelism is born from. Not from God commanding people. It's from a person being captivated by the heart of God for all people. And then them being of the same mind. Them being of the same heart. And now they find a supernatural ability to go and share the gospel. Not by commandment. And woe is the world for the people that have gone by commandment because they've taken a heavy yoke upon themselves and I guarantee the people out there that listen to them preach feel that heavy yoke. They don't feel love. They feel a yoke. Does that make sense? Yes. People can tell if you are ministering to them because your heart's captivated with the beauty you see in them or if it's by commandment. People can tell. Whatever, whatever yoke you're carrying, you're going to be putting on the other person. Yeah. Right? And it can be a good yoke, an easy yoke, a light yoke, or it can be a burden. Yeah. And that's what happens. Yep. That's it. And you carry a doctrine with you. And if you're burdened to do it, right. that comes off, man. And people, people feel it. And they, they, they feel... I mean, and if you, it's a subconscious thing many times, but that's why you're preaching the gospel. You can even find yourself getting angry with people if they don't want to listen. Ooh, or if they don't want to pray the prayer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they're getting in the way of you fulfilling the commandment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if, you're, if you're captivated with love, man, you could see why a person might re wrestle with something that you say. You could see that each person has experienced different things, and there might be different things that have to be kicked down. And you won't walk away feeling angry or frustrated with them, but if you find you're going to be in the village or the town for a little while longer, you start praying to God about them. And you start talking with God about the beauty he sees in them. And Father, you know their heart. You know what's in their heart and what is a stumbling block for them. Lord, give me eyes to discern their heart. Give me the words that can come out of my mouth that they can taste and see that you are good. Right? right? And see, now your whole mentality changes. You're not busy judging them by whether or not they listened. <laughs> you don't walk away thinking, no, they don't even listen. Right? And then you, you, you go in fellowship with God again, right? You, you, you see the value of the human is the thing, not some great commandment. 
Man, what was that? And that's, that's one of the biggest problems. Now listen, God's arm hasn't been shortened because of our ignorance. God has even been able to speak to human's hearts through our ignorance. Right? Right. And so people have gotten saved even in our ignorance. But that doesn't produce a life of freedom going forward after they are saved. Right? It doesn't produce a life of freedom. Right? What did, what did uh, Jesus say? He, he talking about the Pharisees. He, I, think it, I think it's Jesus. Paul may have quoted him or one of the other disciples. The apostles might have quoted him. But Jesus talked about what was you describe in the Pharisees? You travel across the sea make, seeking to make disciples and you make them tenfold more the children of death than yourself. Yes. So from this idea of the Great Commission, and listen, some people who believe in the Great Commission they actually sat with the desire first. Sure. And they actually did go by desire, even though their brains don't understand how to explain, go ye. Mm-hmm. So there are some people out there, actually, that would interpret it that way, but they first sat with the desire. And so they, they're just living by the heart, and they don't really know how to explain it. I've met people like that. Yeah. That even though they were taught it the wrong way, there was a burning in their bones yeah. that was actually pure. Mm-hmm. Right? But, but the, the, a lot of the missionary work that's been born from the Great Commission is the, the end of it, after they believe on Jesus, whether they believe on Jesus or not, their life walking forward with God isn't walking in grace. It's walking in something else, right? So, so much of the missionary work is that we travel across the ocean and then we make the people ten times more the children of death than we are ourselves, right? I mean, Bertie tells a story about this uh, tribe deep in the bush. Bertie used to go off deep into the bush in Africa and minister to people. Or he had to be on a boat for like 15 hours just to get there in a river, you know. And uh, so he had gotten there and evangelized this one tribe and really taught them into grace. And then the next time he had contact with them or something, and I'm sure I'm, I'm missing some of the details, but the gist of the story will be there. Um, and so after some time, after he had evangelized his tribe into the grace of God, American missionaries had come along the tribe and they were in there preaching the law to the tribe, putting them under a heavy yoke from this go ye persuasion. And the, the, the chiefs, you know, because they had a chief of the tribe, the chief's wife stood up and told the missionary he was preaching to them the law. <laughs> he was preaching to them the law. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that in salvation was by grace. And, and so they started ministering to the missionaries. And honestly, that's, it's, it's sad to some degree. We don't have to be overcome with grief, but it's sad to some degree that the missionaries that go forward, they're in need of being ministered to by the people who they're trying to minister to. That's right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you remember Paul was leaving, uh, I don't know whether it was Athens or was some area, I forget where it was. Said that after me, you know, wolves will come into the flock seeking to destroy the truth that he planted in their hearts. And he was preparing them for that. That when they came in, they'd be able to defend themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that they would know. They would have discernment. Test the spirits. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You test the spirits of whether they be of God or not. Do you see how we just tested the spirit? Yeah. We kind of just tested go ye. Right? We looked at the spirit of God and we looked at the foundation God would function from. And then we tested this spirit that says the Great Commission is about a commandment. We tested that spirit by looking at God and what was God's foundation from preaching the gospel? What was Paul's foundation from preaching the gospel? We tested the spirit there. And do you see how we come out with the right way around it? It's the spirit of grace, not the spirit of thou shalt. (laughs) Do you see what I'm saying? Listen, if you're doing it by way of external commandment, you're doing it in your own strength. Yes. You're not doing it by the Spirit of grace. Right. It's not born from the heart. It's born externally. It's a fleshly thing. Right? Yeah. And then we feel good about ourselves because we think we're fulfilling the Great Commission. Yeah. Don't you know? <laughs> and then you feel guilty if you don't. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I hated it. I hated going out knocking doors. Me too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I hated it. But I felt like I have to go. Yeah. That's what, what you're supposed to do. Sometimes you got to leave. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do, and we even had to fill out a paper on it, and how many people witnessed to, yeah. I was, it was so stressful. And it's all part of the, it's all part of the system. You have to have a record of your fruit report so that you can se- secure funds 
<laughs> from people by showing your numbers of salvations. Especially if the pastor of the church is underneath the board that's responsible for their employment. He's feeling, especially in certain systems, he's feeling great pressure to count the altar calls. Yes. He's feeling great yeah. pressure to bring forth altar calls. Okay. He's feeling great pressure to have numbers to show. Look at the fruit, right? right. That gets money coming in. They can send out their report. That, that does all this kind of a thing, right? It's a whole system. Yes. Whereas you're busy with the, the life of God and God's love for people. You ain't counting that thing. Right. And you ain't even thinking in terms of that. You couldn't care less whether people uh, believe in what you're doing. You're not doing it because people believe in what you're doing. No, right. You're doing it because what did Paul say? Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Right. He didn't say woe is me if people don't believe I'm preaching the gospel and so they don't give me money. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see that? He's like, man, there's a burning in my bones that should I not come and reveal Christ in people and to people, listen, man, I'm going to feel frustrated. I'm going to feel like a bottle of beer or soda that's been shooken up and stuck in the freezer for too long. And that when it comes out, it's... <laughs> oh my gosh. Right? And so it's like, I, you know, people will thank you for preaching the gospel, and I understand what they mean. And so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, it's a nice thing when people thank you. They're just feeling grateful that, that they, they see that you've counted the cost and that you've counted what you're laying down is done for their lives. They see that, and so they can feel thankful. So when people thank you, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not why you preach the gospel, right? You're preaching the gospel because of how lovely you see God sees people and what He's done to give them life and to conquer their death so they can see the beauty God sees in them. It's impossible for you to see how beautiful you are to God until your heart is wrapped in light and life and you begin to see yourself clothed in the glory of God. Then you see what He sees. That's one of the reasons for the resurrection. We think the resurrection is just about God conquering death. We, we, we either go all the way on just a belief in the heart or we go all the way just ontological, only physical. Nothing to do with the heart. But He did something in the physical because the death that was physical was speaking a word to our hearts about who we are and telling us we weren't the sons of God. So God wanted to persuade us that He was our Father and we were His sons. So what did He do physically? He conquered the death in a physical body and He glorified a physical body so we could behold the physical body. But then that physical body could persuade us we are the sons of God. And the real way it would persuade us is we would see ourselves wrapped in the same light and life that Abba's wrapped in. And so we would see ourselves in his face. And it would, we would understand why he sees himself in our faces. And then our hearts would say, Abba, the spirit of adoption would testify to our spirits that we are the sons of God. Right? That's why he did it. And so often we go all one way or all the other way. And then we lose complete sight of the other one. We lose complete sight of the other one. And that leads, that you end up getting off into error whenever you go both ways. You could start with a good thing over here where you're just, it's a belief, it's a belief, it's a belief. And you could go on with that for a while and it's very good and it's very good. But if you don't ever connect the belief back to the power of the physical and you don't join the two, eventually down the road you'll get into Gnosticism with the belief. There was never such a thing as sin. We just believed there was sin. There was never such a thing as death. We just believed there was death. Do, do you see? Do you see the difference there? And so the two have to be melded together. And likewise, if you get over and just to, into just the physical, you'll lose sight of what did God believe in his heart about human when he come and did something physical. And you'll just begin pre preaching this thing and you'll come up with all these perverted doctrines around just this physical thing. You've got to meld the two. They come together. They work together. God was doing both simultaneously. Right? Yeah. Right? He's persuading our hearts with what he did physical, yes. physically. Because we are physical beings. And the thing that was tormenting our souls, it says we were alienated in our minds from the darkness of death. We were alienated from the faith of God because of the body of death we were in. And so, how is he now going to come and save us from the wisdom we took on from the serpent? Clothe us in light and life. Right? So then we can start hearing that we are the children of God and believing it. And if we are the children of God, how much more does God care for us than He cares for the lilies and the birds who neither labor nor toil for life? 
And then how great will that light be in us, right? Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll start seeing God, the work God's done. And we'll start seeing how God's done everything. Just like Stephen. For the glory set before Stephen, he disesteemed the stoning that was coming to him. He counted it as a light affliction. He saw the work that God had done to give him glory in life. And he saw it was done. He saw God was at rest. And he entered God's rest for the glory set before him. What glory? <coughs> Human beings see at the right hand of God, the Son of Man, clothed in glory and immortality that conquered death in a body. For that glory set before him, his heart disesteemed the shame of the stoning that was coming towards him. And he was filled with a boldness to say the thing that needed to be said to those Pharisees and to a guy named Saul who was sitting right there. Now, if Stephen had been filled with the spirit of fear, it would have been unto bondage. Not unto the spirit of not unto the spirit, him, him saying, I am the Son of God. I see the Son of Man. It would have been unto bondage, and he wouldn't have said what needed to be said to those Pharisees. But he would have gotten afraid and scared, and he would have tried to preserve his life from the stoning. And he would have even, maybe, even denied Christ just to try to be saved from the stoning. But for the glory set before him, he counted this stoning as a light affliction. It disesteemed the shame of the stoning. And he was filled with the great boldness to speak a word that was going to pierce and cut at their heart. Because yeah. <laughs> he knew the Son of Man has conquered death. This stoning that's coming to me, it can't keep me from God. It can't keep me from life. And he had a spirit of adoption in him that said, even should death come to your house, God's your Father and He won't leave you in the grave. He'll pick you up and see you at the right hand. Look what He did. Yeah. Right? Yes. And so He spoke a piercing word that was not going to be pleasant for those Jewish guys to hear. I mean, He hammered them <laughs> with what they had done and how they missed it. And Saul was standing right there. I mean, Gary pointed out something uh, interesting the other day. It's just, we don't create heavy doctrines out of this, but sometimes it, it helps just to see pictures. Remember when John the Baptist told the Pharisees that God was able to raise up of these stones, children? And he's talking about the Gentiles. Well, Stephen was being stoned, and who was standing there? Saul. Who was the apostle to the Gentiles? Saul. So even from that stoning of Stephen, God was able to raise up children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> because there was a guy named Saul there who was cut at the heart and would felt the prick. How could this guy pray for me? When you see a life like that, it speaks a word that Paul was after life all along. Oh yeah. And when Paul saw that, he saw this guy has a life that I never seen before. And that looks like the kind of life I'm after. And so it was pricking in his heart. And it was, he was questioning things. He was reasoning on his way to Damascus. And then boom. Right? Wow. You guys see that? Yeah. And I tried to explain that in the message with uh, <coughs> loving your neighbor and how that comes forth. Stephen was put to rest by the work he saw God did to clothe a human in glory and immortality. So he saw the work was done. Mm -hmm. That caused him to rest in what the Father did. He saw the Father had done this because the Father loved him. And that put him to rest. It put his flesh to rest in hope, in a certainty that that's what the Father would do with him. And then that brought forth the love of God in him towards his neighbor, even his enemies. Because G who is my neighbor? Your enemy. <laughs> your enemy's your neighbor, bro. Right? Now you see how God brought that forth to Stephen? He didn't tell Stephen he should do that. Do you realize you can't do that if you're looking at it from the perspective of being told that's what you're supposed to do? Right. It's, it's impossible, actually. Right. It's intended, it's, it, in fact, it's so otherworldly or contrary to what the life in the world would say or the wisdom in the world. It's actually designed, if you think about it from the perspective of that's what I'm supposed to do, it's actually designed to bring you to the place where you say, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Ah! Yes, that's the first step to you getting your eyes off of your ability to do it and getting your eyes on the work of God. Because many times when your eyes aren't set on the work of God, they're busy set on your own works. And the first step is for you to see your works are done. Well, where did these eyes go then, man? 
oh, that guy's done something. <laughs> You're fully persuaded you can't do it. Now, that's why God's, oh, that's not. Yeah, you can't do it. You can't do it. Right? You yeah. can't do it. That's the first step. You realize I can't. God actually gets a big smile when somebody says, I can't do it. That's why when the Pharisee is sitting there in Luke 17 or 18 with the, the sinner, the publican, I think, and the, the Pharisee's like, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this sinner next to me. I tithe, da 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 And the sinner is basically like, God, i got nothing to offer you. I can't, I can't justify myself. My works are as done. You know? and, and Jesus says, and which one do you think went away justified? That's Cain and Abel. That example is Cain and Abel. Cain brought the good fruit and was like, look at the good fruit I brought forth, Lord, through the works of my own hands. And Abel came and said, Lord, I, my works can't exalt me. Which one do you think went away justified? Yeah, right. You know, a long time ago I heard, you know who John MacArthur is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, John MacArthur said, you know, there's like three steps to living as a Christian. The first one is when you first come to know the Lord, you say, man, this is easy. This is good, you know. The next one, you start thinking, Man, this is this ain't so easy. This is hard. And then you get to the third step, and it's it's the most important step, where you find this is impossible. This is absolutely impossible. And uh, I thought to myself, you know what? That it's good what he said, but he left the fourth step up. You know what the fourth step is? Man, this is easy. You see what I'm saying? He left. I tell you where he left them. He left them. This is difficult. I need God to somehow help me to do this thing instead of allowing God to do this thing. He still, there was something that was amiss in what he was communicating. Yeah, absolutely. And I love Jared's post. For those of you that are on the Bible study page, go and read it. Because this is shocking for us because we struggle to understand that Jesus is the manifold wisdom of God. He's declaring things from the perspective of human and he's declaring things from the perspective of being God simultaneously. But you know what was different about Jesus from all of us? Jesus is the same of all us. We think Jesus is some superhuman guy as the son of man that was somehow different from us. The thing about Jesus was is Jesus said, Father, I can't do it through my own works. And he actually rested in God to bring forth life in him. Jesus actually was busy with that. Jesus was actually busy with he has an inability in this human flesh to bring forth life. When Jesus went into the whole thing, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor. That's him. Who inherited the earth? He did. God would make him the heir of the world. Well, he was the one who was meek. He was the one who was born in spirit. What does that mean? He said, Father, I can't, claim, I can't reconcile the world through my own works, but by you and your grace and your strength. Jesus understood that. Jesus is the same as all of us. He made God. We got Jesus in this place where He inherited the world by the works of the law or by His ability to work the good fruit. Right. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That leaves us, as Jared pointed out, seeing ourselves as so far away from Jesus we can't identify with Him. And then we don't look into the faith that was in His heart. We look on the works He did externally and we feel so far away we can't identify with Him. We don't see ourselves in His face and then we're left laboring and toiling trying to meet His work standard. Where the thing that Jesus did when He said He kept the Father's commandment was He rested in the Father's love for Him to give Him the world as a gift. He didn't lift one finger on the cross. He didn't lift one finger to justify Himself. He never once performed a miracle to prove who He was. He didn't ascend into the heavenly place with all the loving that He did. He didn't ascend from the grave into the heavenly place and say, look, Daddy, I loved perfectly. He didn't say that. What did He ascend into the heavenly place with? Blood. You know what that blood declared? Look, Daddy, I never trusted in my works even though I had a whole lot of good ones. That blood declared that He considered Himself dead to what He could have through His own works. The blood ran out of the flesh. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The works you can do is corruption. Right? What is Paul, Paul saying? 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God because corruption can't inherit incorruption. So flesh and blood is that which has been corrupted. 
Blood is co that's corrupt. Adam, Adam wasn't created with blood. That's why Adam said Eve was flesh and bone. He never said Eve was flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. He said she's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Jesus was raised flesh and bone. He said, touch me, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. He didn't say flesh and blood. Right? right? So Jesus didn't ascend into the heavenly places declaring to God all the miracles he performed. He didn't ascend to the heavenly place declaring to God, I have peace in every situation. I have joy all the time. I love perfectly, Daddy. Can I have the world now? Yeah, right. No, he ascended into heaven with this blood declaring to God, not by my strength, O oh God, but by you and your grace. Yes. That's what that blood declared to God. The same thing that Abel's declared to God when he came to God with blood. Not by my strength can I be exalted, O oh God, but by you and your grace. Right? Yeah. And that's why, man, Jared said so many powerful things in, in, in that Facebook post, but one of the most powerful ones spoke to the heart of, we see Jesus as this superhuman that somehow has access to something that we don't, and he did all of this by his own ability, and we don't have ability, but Jesus said he didn't do anything that the Father didn't do. What is he saying? The Father brought forth all of this in me, free from my self-effort. Right? That means the Father is responsible for this. This is how the Father brings it forth. When you see that it's the Father that brought this forth in Jesus, your heart begins, it doesn't gravitate towards, look at all the good works Jesus did. I must do those good works if I'm a good Christian. But your heart starts gravitating towards, what is it that brought this forth in Jesus? What did Jesus believe about the Father? and what the Father believed in Him. Now your heart starts looking into that. That's called the faith. And as your heart starts looking into the faith, guess what? The faith will do the same thing in you that it did in Jesus. He's the Son of Man, so are you. Now we're not going to get ourselves on a progress report where we judge our progress on how much we see it coming out of us like it did in Jesus. That's not what this is when we say that God will bring forth the same things in us that he did in Jesus. We're now not going to use a chalkboard and count our progress and generate report cards where we're going to judge ourselves and how far along are we in the faith? How good are we? No, no, our goodness is not defined by how far along we are in the faith. Our goodness is inherent because we come from God. We were a treasure while we were yet sinners. We didn't become more of a treasure. We just went from death to life. <laughs> right? You guys understand that? When he was writing that, it was, I had never heard anything like that before. I mean, coming from a Baptist church, you were almost, Jesus was way up here, and you were way, 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 way. You did not identify with Jesus at all. Other than he died for you. And you're right. terrible, and you don't deserve it. That's it. You know, I was going to say there was nothing special about Jesus. She was like, oh, you can't say that. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> special about Jesus? What? <laughs> well, when you say something like that, a, quali a, a qualification is required after for explanation. Because you're not saying that he's not the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You're not saying that he's not Everlasting Father, that he's not Prince of Peace, that he's not Wonderful Counselor, that the government isn't upon his shoulder. What we're saying is is that there's no difference between us and him. He was human, we are human. Right, yes. right, right. Right, right? <coughs> Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. I think I pointed that verse out a little while ago. Yeah. We don't understand that. He was taught of the Father through the Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth. It, it almost sounds like heresy when you say that there's some equality that you share with God. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, but, in John chapter 17, right before he was he went to the cross, he shared a prayer that was the purpose for his coming. And that was that we might be one with him, even as he is with the Father. So if that was not the purpose for our existence and our coming to understand who we are in him, then why did he pray that prayer? And why did he go to go to the cross and was resurrected from the dead to make that happen? That we might be one with him. Yep. So it's not heresy to say that there is a union that we share with God. Yep. And if you understand the high priest, you see people maybe think if you don't, if you go read Jared's post and you don't see the high priest in there when he says represented in his right. post. 
That's the high priest was supposed to declare the representative of the people. The people saw themselves in the face of the high priest. They identified with the high priest. The author of Hebrews goes into great detail about that. Right? And so the people, when the high priest would go before God, if he came back out, then the people would identify with the high priest. As it went with him, so it goes with us. And so Jesus is the high priest. He's our representative. We're supposed to identify with him. And if the serpent can keep us from identifying with him, then man, he's going to have victory over our emotions. Yes. Right? He's going to have victory over the life we experience in this world. That's why when people say it is heresy to identify with the Lord, it, it is really, that is heresy in itself. Yeah. Yeah. That, right. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah. That's the blasphemy. Yeah. What, did, what did Paul say? I know a man once, he didn't want to say it was himself. I know a man once who was called up for the third heaven. Listen, he's talking about himself. Okay, The third heaven, if you, you hadn't looked into this very much, the third heaven would be where the throne room was. Right? That's where the throne room was. The third heaven. And so Paul is saying, I was caught up unto the throne room. And I saw things in there that were unlawful for humans to speak. Not that God said they were unlawful, but that humans thought it would be unlawful. And we know that humans thought it would be unlawful because... Jesus came speaking the same thing and they crucified the Lord of glory. And they put Paul's head over a a chopping block for saying these things. And listen, if you go look through the history of Judaism, the greatest heretics were always the heretics, were always the guys that had a vision of the throne room and saw somebody else seated there at the right hand of God. You know what's crazy? In the story of Stephen, when he seen them, Jesus standing at the right hand of God, at the beginning of it, it says that Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. Mm. It's like equating the way to be full of the Holy Ghost is to see the Son of Man, is to see a man. Yeah, yeah. It is you the teaching I mean? of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So it would be to blaspheme the Holy Spirit to say that that wasn't of God. You're right. I love how it says that. And Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that means that man was yeah. possessed. We think yeah. full of the Holy Ghost as if we speak in tongues. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, man. <laughs> oh, like this. Yeah, you're right, man. That's good insight. You're right. Yeah. Glory to God. You guys have any thoughts or questions about any of that? Thank you for that answer. Yeah, we got off on a lot. I forgot we we even said. Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, it was good.